Uh, my name is Jason Crable. I'm the new executive director of the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio. And uh, I want to uh, thank you for watching this virtual curator's tour of our annual Christmas display. Um, this year, uh, George has outdone himself. Uh, our theme this year is a Russian Christmas. And I think you'll see why we're so excited to be able to share this with you uh, virtually at the moment and hopefully in person as soon as possible. Uh, George has been uh, helping with our Christmas decorations, has really been doing our Christmas decorations for uh, 20 years now. And uh, this year is really incredible. Uh, so I don't want to take too much time. I want to get to the tour. So I will now turn it over to George to tell you all about uh, this year's uh, exhibit, A Russian Christmas. Thank you, Jason. Today we're at the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio to look at A Russian Christmas. We're going to start our discussion and our, our, our walkthrough of the display with this tree, which is a reproduction of a Russian, Imperial Russian uh, tree from about 1890 to 1900. This tree is indistinguishable from the trees that you would find in the United States, Germany, England during the same time period. Background on that is that Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, Wilhelm II of Germany, and George V of England are all first cousins. They're all grandchildren of Queen Victoria, who first started this tradition in England. So the ornaments that are on this tree date from that time period, from the 1890s to the 1900. The most important figure in the Russian Orthodox Church was Saint Nicholas. So we see him as the gift giver at a Russian Christmas. And the nativity scene that we have below uh, was made in the Eastern European countries, possibly Russia, but in Eastern Europe. So we're gonna look at the drastic changes that move from this time period to the time period across the hallway. This tree is the almost exact opposite of what we looked at earlier, because after the revolution in 1917, as Stalin comes into power in the 20s, we find that Christmas is totally banned. There is no Christmas tree, there is no Christmas celebration. So by 1935, so about essentially you know, 10 or 15 years ago, 1935, there's an article in the Pravda newspaper that says, you know, most of the Christmas traditions that we have are not really Christian, they're, they're pre-Christian. And as such, it would be a boon to the Russian children to allow some kind of celebration to occur. So Stalin relented a little bit and he decided that, well, we should have a New Year's celebration. Now, New Year's in the Russian Orthodox Julian calendar comes at the 14th of January. So this is a Russian New Year's tree that would have come about at this time period. There is no Christmas as we know it, religious symbolism to it. It's all New Year's. The decorations that are on this are mainly from fairy tales. A few of them are historic. We have a uh, almost Viking looking person here and here. We actually have a Viking ship here. One of the things that people often don't realize is that Russia, as we know it, was heavily influenced by the Rus Vikings. That's where the word Russia comes from. And they established part of the ruling class at that time. Uh, Zeppelin up here with CCCP on it. Um, a lot of interesting decorations that came about after 1935. Another character that's important to the Christian or to the Christmas traditions of Russia from this time period is this fellow right here, uh, Did Moroz who translates, that translates into Grandfather Frost. He's a very ancient Slavic mythology character. Um, he came back in the 18th century and totally replaced the St. Nicholas figure because 
He's obviously a religious figure after 1935. And one of the other important characters is this fairy tale character right here. This is Baba Yaga, who's a Slavic fairy tale character. And this is her hut, which moved around on a chicken leg. She was one of those characters that was both a villain and a benefactor of uh, individuals. So now we're gonna move into the rear parlor where we'll see a Siberian winter. This is a flocked tree, winter tree, snow on it. Um, it's decorated with birds like they might be, you know, eating berries and things in the middle of a Siberian winter. Um, the decoration of the birds on those are from Germany and Czechoslovakia and date from anywhere from 1900 into the 1970s. Uh, on the top of the piano, the dominant figure is this uh, Grandfather Frost, which is made out of paper mache, probably in the 1950s or the 1960s. Behind him is a nesting doll, which is a popular part of Russian culture. This one is a medieval warrior, uh, possibly a Viking. Uh, it would have been the largest of the nesting group. It opens up in, in the middle. Unfortunately, this is the only size of those that survive. This is another nesting doll, Russian nesting doll set. This one features the uh, Virgin Mary uh, child, uh, Christ child, and other religious figures. There are 10 of them all together. This was produced in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union and when the country became just Russia again. And it's noted on the bottom, made in Russia. And uh, religious practices were, became, you know, the country became more tolerant of religious practices after the collapse of the Soviet Union. On the small feather tree over here, we have a group of miniature ornaments that would have been made during the Soviet time period. Um, there's small things made of glass, smaller things made of, of plastic, and um, this is the original box uh, that those miniature ornaments from the Soviet Union came in. So this white tree represents the snow and ice of the Siberian winter. It's covered with crystals, um, some of them Victorian, uh, that came off of chandeliers and, and lamps, and uh, some of them more modern. This is a, another white snowy tree. This one is decorated with uh, snowball lights. When the lights are out, these are perfectly white like a small snowball. Uh, they were made by the GE company in Cleveland, Ohio. Above them are twinkler uh, ornaments that were developed by John Garber of Youngstown, Ohio. The heat arising from the, the lights are what caused these to spin. So essentially we have this artistic thought of the Northern Lights and the winds blowing across the Siberian uh, area, creating these uh, um, spinning ornaments. So on the mantel, the most important element that we have that relates to the Russian Christmas are these two figures, the Grandfather Frost, which we've talked a little bit about um, just a moment ago, and this lady who is sometimes called the Snow Maiden, the Snow Princess, or simply Granddaughter Frost. Both of these are made out of cotton fibers that have been spun. The Grandfather Frost is probably from the 1960s or 1970s in terms of age, and the Granddaughter Frost is from uh, the 1970s. This is a, a tree that I've called nuclear winter. It's kind of a political statement, but it also has an interesting history of the U.S.-Russian relations and Christmas decorations. The tree itself is a bare-limbed tree. It has snow uh, on the limbs. The decorations on it are from the 1950s and they're glow-in-the-dark ornaments. During the 1950s and 1960s, both the USSR and the United States were doing testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. There became a very real fear of radiation spreading around the globe on uh, the winds. Now, particularly in the United States, we were afraid of Russian radiation floating on those western winds into the United States. 
During the 1950s, these glow-in-the-dark ornaments were made, and during the 1960s, people became fearful that they had radiation in them, and that's what made them glow in the dark. And indeed, if you held a Geiger counter to these ornaments, you would have a register of radiation. But the radiation level, as we found out much later, is only about the same as the background radiation that we have naturally in the world. But during the 1960s, these ornaments were pulled from shelves. These ornaments were you know, um, often thrown away by um, concerned homeowners and parents um, because of the radiation scare from the uh, um, nuclear testing. This tree is another white feather tree. This one also dates from uh, probably the, the 50s, 60s, 70s. It has Russian ornaments that tell the story of a character called Cipollino. These are fairy tale characters. It's actually a, an Italian fairy tale you know, that was usurped by the Russians because it simply is the struggle between the vegetable people and the fruit people. Now, the fruit people was an allegory for the bourgeoisie who are suppressing the farmers, the lowly vegetables. And so it found great favor in the Soviet era decorations uh, because of, of that story. They developed lots of fairy tale books about Cipollino and many cartoons that went on television. It was an important figure and the Russian fairy tales and within the Russian care, uh, culture. So finding them on um, the Christmas tree decorations is not much of a surprise. Behind me are uh, 14 aluminum trees that date from the late 1950s into the mid late 1960s. Most of them are rotating. They're lit by uh, period color wheels and kaleidoscope lights. So you can see a lot of glitter and sleek aluminum looking there. This same time period fits in exactly with the USSR US space race. These trees were also part of that modernistic, futuristic, sleek um, space type of, of, of concept. And they, so they, they, they fit right into that same idea. Underneath those trees, there's a lot of toys, also gifts from the 1960s. On the table here to the front, we have information about the space race, starting with Yuri Gagarin in 1961 and going up to the first men on the moon in 69. Also, our two books talking about um, the aluminum trees and how they were developed, the different sizes. Most people think of aluminum trees as being just silver in color, but in fact, uh, they were made in multiple colors. On display, we have a blue-green one, and we have a green one, but also gold and pink um, aluminum trees were made. On the mantelpiece, we have some stockings from the 50s and 60s, some flashing lights that were popular, Christmas tree lights that were popular at that time. On this couch, we have some uh, remembrance of the Kennedy assassination, also occurring in the 1960s. On the piano forte in the rear, we have a white village, again, written in that concept of a snowy winter night with the moon shining down on the village. And over on this side, we have a, a table set for a 1960s uh, party. Um, we have a Coke tray from the 1960s, a Coke bottle, um, a tab can, which has uh, just been removed from the Coke products. Both of those are steel cans, not, not the aluminum cans we know of today. And even more interesting and related to the Russian um, exhibit are two pieces of the Berlin Wall made from concrete. The largest one about the size of my hand, I personally 
took from a broken piece of the Berlin Wall in 1970 when I was only 21 years old and quite foolish. Um, the other one is a much smaller piece of the Berlin Wall, which were sold in the early 1990s after the wall was torn down and people cut them up. And somebody had the bright idea, you know, I can sell that as a souvenir. So it has a certificate of authenticity and then a box that's stamped that it's, you know, really from the Berlin Wall. We're in the rising room of the Decorative Arts Center of Ohio. Uh, the large tree in this room is um, filled with Christopher Radko ornaments. He is a designer of Christmas um, decorations and started in the um, mid 1980s. Most of the decorations on this tree date from that time period up until about 2006. The link that we have with these decorations um, is the fact that Christopher Radko went to Poland in the mid 1980s and enlisted Polish glass blowers to start making molds and, uh, and blowing his designs. And at this time, Poland is still part of the Soviet Union, still a member of the Soviet bloc. So the Poles have been making ornaments since the late 1940s. And he changed the whole concept of the glass blowing industry there and greatly increased their economy. And that's probably one of the reasons they were able to move towards the uh, west, the rest of Western Europe as, a uh, as opposed to staying aligned with the, the, the Soviet bloc. The decorations on this tree um, uh, belong to both myself and my daughter. Uh, most of the ones that are mine are personal gifts from um, Christopher Radko for help that we gave him in um, coming up with some of the old designs and old molds. On this side is, um, uh, is a bubble light tree. It's a reproduction of a 1950s um, bubble light tree that Christopher Radko did as part of his you know, retro um, you know, memory, bringing back memories um, designs. This is a uh, Christopher Radko um, patriotic display. Um, it's a um, tree that he actually produced that has an Uncle Sam hat at the bottom. And we have Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson. Uh, we have a patriotic Santa Claus. We also have some uh, ornaments that he designed right after 9-11 that um, represented uh, the Twin Towers and the uh, police and the fire departments of uh, New York City. On the mantelpiece, we find some more Radco decorations. We have two treetops, tree points. This one is Grandfather Frost in beautiful uh, frosted and, and blue colors. The blue coat typically is the traditional color of the coat for uh, Grandfather Frost. Um, we have two smaller ones. This one is another Radco Grandfather Frost in a white coat. This one was made in Poland by one of Radco's uh, competitors, and it's a granddaughter Frost. And then we have another Christopher Radco point over on this side, uh, which is an angel. The interesting part of these is the complicated process that's involved in making these. This is all done as one piece, the whole large piece. This is blown first, then this section is heated up, and then this is blown free and indented. Then another section of the glass rod is heated up into a large ball like this, and then indented, and then the whole thing painted. Lots of room for mistakes in creating so many pieces out of one single piece of glass. Same thing with our angel over there. This particular piece was created in Germany by um, Christopher Redko. This one in Poland. So this nativity represents a divided Germany um, and the Soviet influence that uh, was there after the end of World War II. Um, Germany was, 1945, was, was divided into zones of influence by the uh, victors. 
So um, Germany was divided between the Soviets on the east, the Americans, the um, British, and the French. Um, one of the biggest things that um, happened to the German economy early on was the Marshall Plan. And part of the Marshall Plan in reviving that economy was to bring back the toy and the ornament industry because they were large parts of that economy. So when those items began to be reproduced and again shipped to the United States in those um, later 1940s, the ornaments and decorations, and in this case, a nativity set, had to be marked where they came from. This set is marked Germany, British zone. These pieces are marked on the bottom, made in Germany, Soviet occupied. So these pieces are only made for a short period of time. Later, they're gonna be marked made in West Germany, Western Germany, or made in Eastern Germany. And so uh, these can be dated because of those stamps and because of that history to right after World War II. We're in the lower gallery of the Decker and Bart Center. Um, this tree is, has the concept of link with the Russian um, Christmas in, this, in the sense that all the decorations on this tree were made in the Soviet bloc countries, um, dating from 1940s into uh, the 19, early 1990s. So representative on this tree are Russian ornaments, for example, this um, paper uh, banner, which represents a lot of the fairy tale characters that we saw upstairs. Decorations from Czechoslovakia. We have decorations from East Germany, sometimes marked DDR, Deutsches Democratic Republic. We have some lights that were made in Russia. And we have some pieces that were made in Poland when it was still part of the, the Soviet bloc. Uh, we also have some ornaments like these that were made in Romania and Bulgaria. So overall, this tree represents those type of decorations that we would have seen made from the Soviet bloc countries. And we've got to remember that although the Soviet Union itself had became atheistic, most of those European, Eastern European countries had remained strongly Christian and the Christmas decoration and the Christmas tree um, tradition was still very strong in them. On the uh, uh, table, we see decorations that are made of wood and primarily made in the Erzgebirge region of Germany, which is in um, southeastern Germany. Um, the name Erzgebirge actually means Ur Mountains. And in the 15th century, um, large deposits of tin and silver were made, were found there and mining became a uh, tremendous industry. The um, people of the region also did woodworking from uh, very early on, and they created many beautiful uh, pieces. One of their specialties were uh, mining um, soldiers, uh, figures, and, and, and angels early on. Um, some of the pieces, especially the miniatures that we see on here, uh, were produced in this region uh, before World War II. After World War II, this region ended up in East Germany. And it appears that the Soviets didn't have a lot of uh, use for these small wooden trinkets. And so to a large extent, uh, that um, tradition began to uh, die away. Some of the uh, woodworkers and businessmen were able to escape across that uh, east-west um, German border, because in those early days it was still reasonably porous, uh, and they established um, uh, factories in western Germany. When Germany was reunited in the 1990s, many of them went back into the Erzgebirge region and reestablished woodworking um, areas, and we were once again able to buy um, some of the pyramids and candle arches and figures um, that were produced. Um, a candle arch is a piece like this, which actually has an arch and candles across the top of it. These are actually made in the 1990s 
in the Erzgebirge region, and they have little stickers on them. Right behind it, we have a Chinese knockoff, okay? Very hard to tell the difference between the two, but uh, this one and this advent calendar piece back here and this one are actually Chinese uh, versions of knockoffs, whereas this one, this one, and this one are uh, actually candle arches from the Urzeberg region. Then we have pyramids, which turn from the heat of candles down below. This particular one is interesting in the sense that on the bottom is a label that states that it was made in the DDR, the Deutsches Democratic Republic, East Germany. So it would have been quite a, a rare piece that uh, would have been produced and then shipped uh, and ported to the United States. Scattered among that, I could say there's a lot of small miniatures that would have been made before the war. These, these pyramids, this is the smallest pyramid that uh, I have in my collection. It's about five inches tall. The largest one that we have in our collection is about six feet tall. So this is the last piece that visitors uh, to the Decorative Arts Center would see as they're ready to exit the museum. Uh, this is a Russian aluminum tree. In the upper gallery, we saw some American uh, aluminum trees. And you can see that this is very different from that. Um, some might use the words, it's more delicate. Others might use the idea that it's much more frugal in its use of materials but the limbs itself on this are very feather-like, uh, very delicate. It has a collection of Russian decorations on it. Again, mostly from probably the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, there are pieces like the star at the top that are cardboard, many that are glass. This is a Russian soldier. This is a grandfather frost made out of cotton. Um, and there's even some pieces down here that um, are reflectors that are made out of uh, plastic. Um, all of these, again, are, are Russian-made, and the tree itself, uh, this is the original box that this uh, Russian aluminum tree uh, came in. So as I say, this is our last element, last part of the display of the Russian Christmas. Uh, we've had an enjoyable time, and Hopefully at some time in the future, you'll be able to actually come and visit our display in person. Thank you. I started collecting Christmas ornaments, decorations in 1971. Uh, I was uh, newly married. Uh, my wife and I both liked antiques and we also found that we could buy antiques at an auction cheaper than going to Lazarus and buying new furniture. And so for our very first Christmas, we decided we ought to put old Christmas decorations on our tree. And so we both went to our families and said, hey, can we have some of those old decorations at the bottom of the box that we don't put up anymore? And uh, of special interest to me, because I grew up in the 1950s, were bubble lights. And um, my parents said, yeah, you can have some of those ornaments and things. And I actually picked up some you know, World War II ornaments. And, uh, but the bubble lights were all burned out. We threw those away a long time ago. Well, in my heart of hearts, I knew in the attics of Logan, Ohio, there had to be strings of bubble lights that still worked. So um, my wife and I put an ad in the newspaper that said that we wanted to buy old bubble lights. And sure enough, we got phone calls. And more often than not, they were from little old ladies. And I say that with love because I'm now that little old man. You know, they brought down those Christmas um, bubble lights, but they also brought down all their old Christmas things, you know, with the story, well, my family is gone. You know, the kids now live in Indiana or New Mexico or Florida. I don't put up a tree anymore. Would you like to buy all the rest of this stuff? Well, the answer was yes. Yeah, the rest of it is history. Uh, we've been collecting uh, ever since. Um, the actual concept of doing museum displays started right here at the Decorative Arts Center um, in uh, 1999. Um, we were invited by um, uh, 
um, Tom Laporte, who was the director at the time, to put up a large Christmas tree of, of Santa Clauses, uh, just one tree, and it was in the main hallway upstairs. And after that, the very next year, we were asked, gosh, would you do the whole museum? And um, so that started our um, um, collection that was designed specifically for museum displays. And uh, over the years, we've done quite a few in the local area and other parts, and we've set up displays um, at conventions and, and things like that. So uh, most of our collection today is, is designed to be um, set up for displays like you're seeing here today. The fact that the Decorative Arts Center um, plans their uh, exhibits out um, uh, one to two years in advance is a large help to Jeannie and I. Uh, we knew uh, last January, um, February, that the um, gallery display upstairs would be a Russian exhibit. Um, and when we first began to talk about that, you know, Jeannie and I certainly bemoaned to the director of Russian Christmas. They didn't do Christmas. Um, how are we going to do this? Um, but fortunately, we had basically a year uh, to think about how we might come up with uh, the display uh, that you've seen today. Um, the first things that we decided to do was to come at uh, this display, what we've described as sideways, uh, not directly a Russian Christmas, but as, as you've seen, we have a Siberian winter room. We have a 1960s um, room that's filled with uh, aluminum trees. And then we relate that to what was happening with Russian culture and um, U.S. Um, Soviet relations during that time period. But there are also um, trees that have nothing but Russian ornaments on those. Um, a few of those we had in our collection um, to start with. Um, a few more we have uh, bought over the um, um, succeeding year. And some of the others also have come from uh, a fellow collector's um, collection. Uh, Jerry and Darla Arnold of um, uh, Cleveland have lent us some of the glass, paper, and, and cotton decorations that you saw on the... Um, Russian themed trees um, upstairs. My favorite part of the exhibition uh, this year, um, you know, of course, we always enjoy everything, you know, doing it and, and, and doing it the best we can, but my favorite part has to be the aluminum trees. Um, that was one of my central ideas um, starting very early on, was to create that aluminum forest. Um, Generally, if we put up an aluminum tree, it's only one at a time, but this gave us the opportunity to create that whole forest of spinning trees lit with um, the uh, color wheels, um, which I think created a very dramatic um, room. Um, I grew up in the 50s, and when the aluminum trees began to come out in the 1960s, boy, I was dead set against them. Um, if you could go back and talk to that uh, um, uh, 18, 19 year old George Johnson, you'd hear him say, I'm never going to have an aluminum tree. And now I have 16 of them. <laughs> so, um, but that's the time period of, of, you know, my high school days, my graduation, my, you know, you know dating my wife, uh, going to college, getting married. Those are those type of memories that the, those aluminum trees um, um, bring back to me. So out of this exhibition, those are my favorite. Some of the favorite decorations, my, my wife in particular likes these um, small houses um, that were made in, in Czechoslovakia. Um, I like some of the ornaments. I'm a historian, okay? That's my you know, original degree. And I, I like the fact that some of these ornaments right here, you know, they, were, they, they tell a story. The molds were originally made in Germany in the 1920s and the 1930s. And then they were repurposed again um, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And we have that history stamped onto the cap 
where it says made in East Germany or made in the DDR. I, I particularly find that element of history and how that culture has been laid one on top of another um, to, be, um, to be fascinating. Um, but I think in terms of the emotion, um, I have to come back to the idea that the aluminum trees are what bring back uh, this particular display, bring back that you know, personal emotion to me. Over the years, um, I'm an author of, of five books on, on Christmas decorations and um, museum displays and um, guest speakers and things like that. And over the years, I've had a few people ask me about, you know, how do I start collecting? What should I collect? And I've even had a few people ask me, what should I invest in? And uh, my answer to investment is don't invest in Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the antique market goes up and down. Anybody that deals with antiques understands that that market goes up and down. If you, you know, buy things and, and expect to make a fortune out of it five years later, um, you'll probably be sadly disappointed. My advice for people who are interested in, in collecting uh, Christmas is start off with your childhood memories. That's important, that, that emotional connection. Um, as I stated earlier, I started off collecting bubble lights because it was a childhood memory. Um, collect the things that you like, the things that you find beautiful, um, things that speak to you. Um, um, sometimes some of the ornaments are quite expensive. Um, my advice to people, they would, you know, starting collecting and they say, oh my gosh, that's so expensive. Don't buy it. <laughs> you know, don't take food away from your family. Don't, don't forego your rent and gas and electric payments to, to buy Christmas decorations. Um, but when you do find the things that you like, um, buy them because, they, because you like them, because they say something to you and because you can afford it. And then, you know, proudly display it. Talk to your family about it, talk to your neighbors about it, you know, and, and share the Christmas spirit with people.